I have notes here to introduce each presenter um, so I didn't get their title wrong or pronounce uh, awkward last names like Hill incorrectly. Um, oddly enough, I do have introductory notes for myself. No, I'm just kidding. I'm Robbie Bolton. I'm the library director uh, here at Spring Arbor University. And this talk I'm going to share with you this morning is a condensed and uh, snippet of a keynote address I gave at the Snezik Library Leadership Institute, speaking of complicated, na difficult names to pronounce, Snezik. Uh, and that's the CCCU Library Directors Conference that was held in Boston earlier this summer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> If you want to heckle Dr. Kono's presentation, he's presenting at 11 a.m. <laughs> While he's looking that up, I'm gonna, gonna brag on Robbie. He did a lot of the legwork to set this whole thing up. Sure yeah. Thanks. And I'm gonna try to stand over here so I don't trip over all these cords. See that window. Sorry about that. Switch that correctly. Uh, let's see if this works. Come back, come back. There we are. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, so learning spaces and third places on Christian college campuses, liberal arts college campuses, like ours here at SAU. And I'm the library director, so most of the places, the places that I'm focusing on are those spaces and places in libraries. So what place, what role does a library fulfill at a university, at a small liberal arts college campus, or at any university and college for that matter? Civil War historian Shelby Foote once said that a, a university is just a group of buildings gathered around a library. Librarians love quotes like this. And I really just left this in here so you could see this image of Shelby Foote, the Civil War historian, because it looks like he's trying to Jedi mind trick you here. He's like, you will agree with this, my statement, even if you don't like it. Um, it has long been said, other, a little more understated comments, which I just think is more accurate, that libraries are the heart of a university or a college, the heart of an academic institution. Um, one survey, one study that was recent, recently completed on academic libraries in place, the role that libraries fulfill on the college campus, they interviewed and surveyed students on how they felt about their physical library. And I'm going to read to you some of those responses. Student one, I'm filled with a special sense of connectedness to the university's scholarly traditions. The library atmosphere puts me in a totally different frame of mind. I, it might be the coffee and the caffeine kicking in for that student. And the second student said, the academic library is to the university as the church is to God. And I'm confident that was a philosophy major. Um, <laughs> because that seems a little over the top. And the author goes on in the study to say the, that, that uh, in summary, that no other building can so symbolically and physically represent the academic heart, again, that heart metaphor, of an institution as a library can. And so I really don't know if libraries are like a church to the university. I think that is a little bit much. Um, and I really don't think, I don't know what 
if Shelby Foote was thinking of his college undergrad experience, because I don't think uh, um, that universities that the library are really just a group of buildings gathered around a library. I don't think that's true necessarily. I do like the heart metaphor, um, but I just don't think it accurately also actually doesn't depict you know the role that libraries fill um, and the library as a place fills on a Christian college liberal arts campus. But I do think that academic libraries on small Christian college campuses at liberal arts schools like ours do fill a very important role and have come to fill this role in the last maybe 10 or 15 years. That of the primary role of the third place. And so for you not familiar with the term, it kind of comes from sociology, anthropology, which I um, have no formal training in either of those, those areas. I was hoping some of our sociology faculty would be here and they could tell me where, I, where I'm wrong here. Um, but so the thinking in sociology for, for a long time has been the first place is home, your home life. That's where you spend most of your social, your most significant social interactions and the majority of your time. And that second place where you spend the second most amount of time and the second most significant social interaction, social environment is uh, work or school. And on a college campus, that's, uh, that's school for undergraduates, for faculty and staff on those campuses, it's, uh, it's work. But uh, the, the same place um, uh, remains. So in the mid-90s, sociologist Robert Putnam authored a book called Bowling Alone. And he chronicles the declining social capital in American society, from declining church attendance, decreased, decreasing membership in civics organizations, to fewer people joining bowling leagues, hence the title. Uh, and not long after that, another, another sociologist came along, Ray Oldenburg, and he wanted to kind of build on this idea of declining social capital, but he wanted to take a more positive view, and he said, what places in society and communities are actually, we're not seeing a decline in social capital, but we're seeing thriving social capital in these areas. So in his book called The Good Great Place, he identifies places like coffee shops in communities, public libraries, barber shops, bookstores, and churches that are functioning as, as third places. And I, so I, in the example, and he gives case studies for each of these different types of successful third places. I think it's easy to recognize how a public library can fulfill the role of a third place in a village, in a city, in a larger community. Um, but there's not been a lot written on academic libraries and their role is functioning as a third place. There's been absolutely nothing written about third place in academic libraries on small Christian liberal arts college campuses or even liberal arts college campuses for that matter. So Oldenburg identifies eight characteristics of a third place and I'm gonna go through them now and I want you to think about your experience with small Christian college libraries or liberal arts college libraries or even libraries in general or if you wanna think about spaces on our campus or campuses you are familiar with as I go through the list. Uh, characteristic number one, they occur on neutral ground. Individuals may come and go as they please. These places are very available and accessible to all. Uh, third places are a leveler, accessible to the general public, do not set formal criteria for membership and exclusion from the president of a university on down to our somewhat emotionally unstable patron who comes to our library for internet access Looking at you, Dr. Baker. Um, all are welcome. All are welcome in campus libraries. <laughs> um, and that's, that is something we've seen shifted in library policies, being more open to community patrons, non-students allowing them to check out books, to use computers, internet access, and resources in libraries. That's something that's changed in the last decade or 15 years. Three, conversation is the main activity. The talk there is good. You have to go all the way around, Mike. I might be done by the time you get here. The talk there is good. It is lively, scintillating, colorful, and engaging. Libraries don't necessarily encourage loud, boisterous conversation, the type that Oldenburg discusses. But if you've been in our library here uh, during the middle of the day, it can be loud, especially when that bean grinder is going in the coffee shop. Um, but libraries have become much more accepting of collaborative work environments in the last 15 uh, years or so, encouraging loud activity, talking, uh, cooperative work and learning and study time. 
Four, there are regulars. What attracts the regular visitor to a third place is supplied not by the management, but by fellow customers, in the case of library patrons. You'll see the same faculty cycle through it using the library on a regular basis. You'll see the same groups of students that like the atmosphere provided for studying, the same staff, same community people come in, whether we like it or not, they keep coming back. Uh, which is, that's okay. And and we have our student workers are also, I would consider student workers in a place like a library, regulars, people that are friendly faces for patrons to interact with. Um, I, I think of a couple of faculty that they function in our library when they're not in class using the library is almost this de facto office hours. They're perpetually in a state of office hours. Um, I don't know how they can survive or get anything accomplished, but as I see, Art history professor Jonathan Rink at a table grading, constantly getting interrupted by his students because he's in the library more often than I am. He thinks I'm joking, but I, I'm really not. Um, five, accessibility and accommodation. Uh, third places that render the best and fullest service are those to which one may go alone at almost any time of day. Uh, our library hours are not atypical, 7 a.m. in the morning till midnight during the week. Um, and you're always going to find people there. It's kind of like Cheers. You know, you, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. You go and you don't expect like, necessarily plan to see people there, but you expect to see someone that you recognize. Uh, six, low profile, low key structure, typically plain. Um, th the third place, this characteristic, it serves to discourage pretension among those who gather there. For some libraries, uh, pretension is just part of the the architecture and of traditional library looks and feels for libraries that have adopted more of, an, of a modern contemporary information commons uh, architectural style look and feel, uh, this is easier to achieve to have the low key profile and structure. Uh, seven, that there's a playful mood, joy and acceptance reign over anxiety and alienation, Oldenburg says. Uh, I think this is probably the one that maybe is the most difficult for libraries because a lot of times when people are in, in a library, uh, there's anxiety because they're working on projects and papers and presentations and there's maybe some stress or there's difficult work ahead. So sometimes joy and then playful mood are not always part of, of that work. Um, and finally, home away from home, uh, offering a congenial environment, though a radically different kind of setting from the home, that a third place is remarkably similar to a good home and the psychological comfort and support that it extends. And in a library, I'd think of support library faculty to help with research assistance and those nagging APA citation challenges that all students have because APA is awful. I'm looking right at the camera when I say that. <laughs> APA is awful. Um, or writing center tutors that are available, student workers or fellow, fellow students and faculty that are working alongside you on their own projects. Okay, so how do we get to this point? How did libraries become third places, uh, third places in their campus communities? Four factors, and I'm gonna to try to breeze through them quickly. One, the death of the student union and the student center. 40, 50 years ago, student centers probably were the third places on campus. Um, there were restrictive rules about visiting in residence halls and genders co-mingling. Even on secular campuses, that was uh, much more restrictive 40, 50 years ago. And so students' union, student centers were a much more happening place. Secular schools moved away from those restrictive residence policies uh, quickly, more quickly than our schools did. We still have, Christian colleges still have those policies that encourage students to seek out a third place outside, outside of residence halls. Um, also uh, related, related to the death of student unions, contributing to that is the increase in uh, student housing becoming awesome. Little hotel rooms. 40, 50 years ago, it was a box. It was a box with a desk, a desk and a spring bed, and you only wanted to spend time there to sleep. And now there's the amenities are fantastic. The rooms are very nice, and students come in with 40-inch TV screens and video game consoles. Uh, you don't need to leave your room to be entertained in a student union or elsewhere on campus. Uh, okay. In libraries themselves, the rise of the info commons, learning commons, uh, library philosophy, 
uh, architecture of library buildings and trying to bring as many services and amenities under one roof as possible have led to libraries becoming more of a third place. Evolving policies, uh, the decline of curmudgeonly policies with libraries. You don't see many, I hope not at least uh, our campus, shushing librarians. Um, and we allow food and drink to happen in the library. Maybe that's because a coffee shop has been put in libraries and so it's uh, not necessary, but also I think it's, this is how people, uh, this is how society is. We go to church now, we expect to take our coffee into church in the sanctuary with us. Growing up, I never would have done that and would have been scolded. Definitely not red punch or Kool-Aid into the sanctuary. Um, and shifting faculty behaviors, um, that there was kind of some kind of thought that, well, as faculty, um, newer faculty, junior faculty uh, start doing working at universities and colleges, they've grown up on electronic resources the last 15 years or 20 years. They're going to be less interested in a physical place. But actually, the research is showing the opposite is true. One study quotes junior faculty saying things like, uh, even if I could get all of my research materials electronically, I would still want to go to the library to work and read. The library is a sanctuary of solitude. There's a lot of religious language that people bring about with, the, with libraries. The solitude enables more sustained concentration, and the library is an oasis of solitude. Uh, um, so one, one library is placed researcher speculates that because younger scholars have not had to use library for physical materials, instead accessing them electronically, perhaps they seek out the library space to find the very qualities the electronic experience lacks, a sense of sanctuary, an intellectual state of mind, spiritual sensations of knowledge, and an encapsulating solitude. And finally, learning space and collaborative spaces, the understanding that more group work um, is becoming uh, assigned for projects and students, that we've learned that group work is beneficial to learning, and trying to accommodate the way that students actually work. I have two stories, and I'll share one of them in closing. When Steve Jobs took over Pixar, uh, whatever year that was, he designed a new build building around a central atrium space, this one right here. Different departments and areas of the company surrounded this space. His goal was to create a place where innovation could happen. Creatives from different parts of the company would interact in this space or, or so Jobs thought. When the building opened, the space, the space was usually vacant. Employees were remaining in their silos, in their departments. Jobs realized that he needed to do more than just create a beautiful collaborative space, but also needed to give Pixar employees reason to interact there and co-mingle. So first he moved employee mailboxes to this central atrium. Shortly thereafter, he moved the cafeteria to this atrium, then the coffee shop, then the gift shop. Finally, he closed all of the other bathrooms in the building with the only bathrooms available in this central atrium space. He finally backed off on that after a couple of years and reinstated other bathrooms. So why, why is this? this uh, story of jobs important because I think we can design the most beautiful spaces. We can design what we think is the ideal, but it does take intentionality when turning a space into a place. A place will be used that will become a third place. We must be intentional about cultivating these spaces when we design them. And we must observe how spaces are actually utilized by our faculty and our students. One study in Nevada, Reno this fall just talked about that libraries did a study of how students were using group collaborative work areas and spaces and found that the way students were using them were completely different than what they thought. That students weren't actually working in, in unison in groups at a table, but were sitting there in community just to study next to each other and to support each other and encourage each other, provide accountability. Um, we must try, try as best we can to anticipate future uses of space and changing user behaviors. So I'll stop there and thank you and take any questions in the two minutes I have left. Well, I think with the, you, you guys have done a really good job of doing that, <coughs> here, making that third place, but what's like some downfalls to that? You know, so like, you, okay, now we've got five people upstairs trying to like, you know, section them off, but like what are some, do you see any downfalls to that? I mean, there is, a, I think you have to try, you have different, users, in, in libraries you have different users, you have faculty who have different expectations and needs and use for space, 
you have students, you have the outer student that wants to be in a quiet study room just by themselves and not be interrupted and have a very silent work area. And then you have the community patron that wants to come in and use internet access. And you have staff that are coming in and they want to get coffee. You know, it's, it's hard to silence that bean grinder. So trying to meet those uh, different neat types of patron needs uh, and accommodate that. I think we try, like upstairs in our library, we have a quiet area, we have quiet study rooms, we're exploring how to add more quiet study space because there are students that want that just for themselves. And then trying to have quiet study space that allows groups of students to work together. And then having open, open spaces, which is most of our main level where students can collaborate, be, as Gutenberg describes, a little boisterous and loud as they're doing work and working together. Um, so I think, I think the challenge is trying to still meet the needs of those who want solitary. You know, the very traditional, I'm in my study carol, I want it to be dead silent in the library while I'm doing my work, I'm trying to accommodate as best you can, but also trying to accommodate, create spaces that can meet the needs of those that are going to work together and collaborate in work areas. Yeah, Marty. Robbie, early on you mentioned the book Golden Alone, and then you mentioned another book. What was it? It was The Good Great Place by Ray Goldenberg. So can I start a rumor that the new bowling league is going to be in the lower level of the library? <laughs> I think you're quoting me correctly. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Linda. Uh, 